next speaker is me. And I'm going to address the topic of Georgia industry and foreign policy. Uh, how we got where we are. Uh, well, I mean, the ones that are already one. Those, those are your favorite ones. I'm and emphatic to add that there are people in this room, um, several of them are seated right down front here at this table, that are actually way more expert on this topic than I am and lived through the blood and guts. As after it has been, okay, that, that they tried to get a really good in-stream flow policy instituted in Georgia that rose up out of some excellent science that came out of wildlife resources. Um, in particular, um, Jimmy Evans was involved in it, uh, Russ England was involved in it, I believe that, uh, that, that Chuck and Mike, y'all were in the background, and Les Ager was in the background. And there, there were a lot of people that tried to get good flow policy established in Georgia. And I'm going to share with you some facts, and then I'm, at the end, and I'll just give you the spoiler alert now. There was another agency in Georgia that's not the Wildlife Resources Division that's a part of DNR um, that, that nicks what, what um, good, reasonable people were trying to do. Um, but all is not false, and uh, there are people working on it, uh, hence, hence this presentation. Um, I would argue uh, that Georgia is perhaps the most geologically and therefore hydrologically diverse state in the Union. Uh, I haven't been to every single state, but I have been to most of them, and uh, the, the geology and resultant hydrology in Georgia is really quite fascinating. Um, most writers and presenters um, divide the state into four um, eco-regions or geologic regions. Um, the, the Blue Ridge, the Ridge and Valley, the Piedmont, and the Coastal Plain. Um, but those of you that have spent any time working in the Piedmont or working in the Coastal Plain realize that lumping those regions into to one is, uh, is simply not correct. Um, most of my work has been in the coastal plain and on the coast. Uh, and I can, I can tell you that the coastal plain is at least five different eco-regions exclusive of the salt water itself. Uh, so uh, as a result, we have a, an extremely high diversity of flowages and flow types um, and, and therefore flow issues in Georgia. We also have a very diverse human population that's spread across, and this is just a planar view of, uh, of Georgia, what, what EPD calls 14 river basins, but I should, I should note that, um, for example, the Omogi, Oconee, and the Ohupi Altamaha are actually all one river basin, it's called the Altamaha, and the Flint and Chattahoochee are part of one river basin, and it's called the Apalachicola. Um, so no, but no matter how you um, divvy it up, whether you're a lumper or a splitter, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fairly diverse just diagrammatically. Um, and I, I should have pointed out in my introductory comments that all of these river basins have um, a river keeper. Um, and they're all, uh, they're all represented here today with the, with the exception that the Alwapi River, as far as I know, doesn't have a river keeper group. It does have some friends of sorts of groups, primarily in the Tallahassee area. Um, I should note that the Tennessee River Keeper is not based in Georgia, but there is a River Keeper for the Tennessee system. And Jesse, you're going to have to help me. Who's responsible for the Tallapoosa? Is it y'all or is it that boy in Alabama? It's unclear. Neither. Uh, Alabama Rivers does some work in the Tallapoosa, and we work with the Nature Conservancy on some Tallapoosa okay. issues. So maybe the Tallapoosa is not represented. Um, so it'd be the Tallapoosa and the Hot Lockney that don't have river keepers, but all these other waters do, and all of us are concerned about flow. It's hard to have a river or a creek without water in it. Um, there's also a lot of diversity in Georgia underground, and I hope most of you realize, and I'm simply just uh, preaching to the choir or being Captain Obvious, but uh, these underground resources are, are extremely diverse, particularly in South Georgia, but going from north to south, there's a limestone karst aquifer in that northwest corner associated with the ridge and valley. And then it's, it's probably in reality thousands of crystalline rock aquifers 
in the, in the um, Blue Ridge and Piedmont region. And then when you get near the fall line and cross the fall line, you get into a layer cake of aquifers that have recharge areas that are um, unique to each aquifer and sensitive uh, because where the water gets into them from the surface, it can, of course, be depleted and carry pollutants. And there are a lot of discharge points of these aquifers into each other and into um, surface waters that are, that are very complex. And so that, that's why I argue that the water resources of Georgia uh, exist in a very high diversity, I think probably um, exceeding anywhere else in the country. And therefore makes management issues quite complex. Um, the, the, the waters themselves are extremely um, picturesque. This is the Ottawa River at, uh, at San Sabilla Bluff, um, one, of, one of the rivers of my youth. Uh, this is the Satilla, um, just, just below where the Little Satilla is coming in to it in Brantley County, another river of my youth. And each of them is beautiful in, in their own unique ways. Um, People in this room will know exactly what this is if, if you're a Centrarchid head. And uh, if you care to count them, there's 13 red breast beds right there. I mean, I, I'm not telling you where that is. Uh, <laughs> other than it's in a Blackwater River in South Georgia. Uh, and we enjoy rivers for a lot of different reasons. Um, uh, from, from hunting and family excursions associated with that sort of thing to swimming. This is a blue hole just north of Bainbridge on the, uh, on the Flint. Um, cold water species, this is the Chattooga. Uh, I stole this slide from Derniac. I think I got it in and it's an email um, three days ago. Um, this is a Bartram bass, not very far downstream of where that fish was caught maybe 15 miles, but in a, in a different season of the year, obvious, obviously. And then there are people that enjoy really weird stuff in our river. I have no idea why you would give a damn about catching a, a gar on a but, but my son is real into stuff like that, um, to the point where he had to have his picture taken. Um, and then, of course, there are a wide variety of things that we enjoy rivers for uh, um, that have nothing to do with fishing, as you all know. This is a shot just below Yellow Jacket Shoals on the Flint. Um, sidebar, all you undergrad and grad students, quit doing slides like this, okay? <laughs> just eliminate it from your life. The only reason I'm doing it is to illustrate that you shouldn't do it. Okay? <laughs> but, but I had to do it. Um, and this is a thumbnail sketch of flow policy in Georgia. Uh, in the early 70s, uh, we, even before the 70s, we had Clean Water Act legislation. But in the early 70s, we had federal Clean Water Act legislation. And that, that's all about returns. And that's important to keep in mind about pipes that go back in the river, because that's an important thing. You do need to put the water back. But it wasn't to regulate the flow. It was to regulate the quality of the water that was going back. But it turns out to be important later. In 72, we had the Groundwater Use Act in Georgia. It was basically a permitting act. But in the language of the, of the Groundwater Act, it invoked um, the uh, doctrine of, of reasonable use. Um, in 77, the first major thing um, occurred, which was an allocation amendment, a water allocation amendment to the Georgia Water Quality Control Act, uh, in which surface water withdrawals were acknowledged to be um, uh, subject to the reasonable use doctrine, and it operationalized uh, an informal 7Q10 management approach. If you don't know what 7Q10 is, I'll tell you in a little bit, but meanwhile, look on your little smartphone and see what it means. Um, it's basically an engineering approach to managing water quality, and a 7Q10 flow is a, is a statistical flow. Um, and then in 95, the Wildlife Resources Division produced the formal set of recommendations that I referred to, 
And 7Q10 was acknowledged as a way to manage um, water flows, but it was not the recommended method for doing it. There, was, there were several other methods that were recommended sort of as a, 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 a buffet of, of, a, of a reasonable approach to managing flows. That led to a con the, the convention of a multidisciplinary team of stakeholders, um, and they and they pretty much endorsed the WRD approach. But ultimately, and this is according to a paper written by an EPD author, senior DNR managers um, rejected the plan. I think maybe one of y'all might have been in those meetings. So I'd love to, on the, on the break, hear what actually happened when the senior DNR managers rejected it, because I think there's a backstory there. Um, and then the Georgia DNR board adopted um, those recommendations um, four, three, four years later as their own. And the way it was codified in this, in this uh, this, this policy rubric was that you could pick several different ways of establishing minimum flow. All of them involved huge expenditures of money um, by either the permittee or the state to determine what that minimum flow should be, or you could just use 7Q10 to, to allocate the, 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 the permit. Um, parameters to allocate the water under the permit parameters. So guess what everybody did since since 2001? 7Q10 has become the policy for the state of Georgia, de, de facto and more or less officially. And so it was actually used in the um, statewide water planning process um, as the metric against which gap supply gaps were measured. So when we did statewide water planning all over Georgia, 7Q10 was the standard that we were trying to come up to in many cases. And that's now been formalized for a second time in the 2017 plans. So that's a thumbnail sketch of how we got to a 7Q10 standard. Meanwhile, this is housing density. Uh, the southeastern United States is growing like crazy. And you can see that the growth is along the two coasts, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, and then what's important to us along the foothills of the Appalachians on both sides of it, with Atlanta being the poster child for um, <coughs> Metro Sprawl. And of course, all of, all of that growth in those um, foothills on the southeastern side of the Appalachians that are in headwaters, which are not necessarily great places for water supply. That's associated with uh, rapid expansions of impervious surface. This is the upper Flint. The hot pink area is the airport. Um, and it goes down to about the fall line. And when you go forward in time from 1974 to 08, you can see that it densified around the airport. And you can see Noonan, Fayetteville, Peachtree City, and Griffin um, densifying in terms of, of uh, acres of impervious surface. So large increases in population, um, large increases in, in impervious surface, and then in the ag sector, huge increases in water permits. Uh, irrigation technology became much more modern in the 1970s with centers of the ag, and we now have, this, this number's out of date, it's now approaching 26,000 permits statewide. And you can see the distribution here. The red dots are surface water permits. The black dots are um, groundwater permits. Um, that, ground, that heavy groundwater area is in the Florida <coughs> plain where the Florida aquifer is very close to the surface. And what you need to know about that is that that water strongly interacts with creek and river flow in that area. The groundwater is the river water, and the river water is the groundwater in, in that area. We also experienced massive losses of wetlands um, over, over that time period. Um, these are statistics from the Satilla, which is represented in the bar graph, and the Ogeechee, where they each lost about a quarter 
of their forested wetlands during the period 1970 to 2000, just in a 30-year period. And that's what, that's what that looks like from the air. This is still going on today. That's the, that's the channelization of a wetland where the farmer studiously stayed out of the 404 jurisdiction in order to dry out that field. Um, that field is now in blueberries. So this, these conversions are still happening in non-jurisdictional wetlands, um, hydrologically important, but not under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And this is in the Brunswick area where we're now putting um, subdivisions in really arid places. <laughs> There's no water there at all. Um, and of course, then you you know when you go from that to houses. Um, on quarter acre lots, you're generating a lot of impervious surface that's feeding into those wetlands. Uh, meanwhile, interestingly, um, rainfall, average rainfall in Georgia has stayed about the same. We came out of a relatively dry period in the 40s and 50s into a relatively wet period in the 60s and 70s. It's important to note um, that a lot of um, the, the baseline information for permitting the law was developed during a, re a relative period of abundance. Um, and then we, we've moved back into uh, a, a relatively dry uh, era, uh, th this year accepted. Uh, you can also notice that in terms of total annual rainfall, that that graph has gotten a little bit noisier. The highs are higher, the lows are lower. Uh, in my world, we call that climate change. <laughs> um, this is the Palmer Drought Severity Index from one, this is West Central Georgia, and you can see that we had some, some what I call big dog droughts back in the 40s and 50s, um, but we've had more frequent and um, a couple of equally large droughts uh, in, the, in, rec in, in recent decades. So keep that in mind as I show you the next few slides. Uh, some of us began to wonder where all the water went. Um, when we, um, I, I first started thinking about it when I was doing research at CRD um, in the late 1980s. I had no idea what we were getting ready to see for the next couple of decades. And when I published my first paper on it in 1989, um, this is the Satilla in 2006. And that's those are lime, that's a little bank of lime rock in the Satilla just upstream of uh, Warner's Landing. Um, that most, I, I had never seen those rocks the whole time I was growing up. And uh, in this particular photograph, I was uh, about 49 years old. And there was something wrong with my midsection there. I wanted to figure out what that is. But I was paddling to get it off. Uh, this is Snipe Shoals, um, which is in the upper Flint. It's the last major shoal before you leave the shoal area of the Flint right before you hit the fall line in the summer of 2011. This is yellow jacket shells uh, in um, the autumn of 2011, um, looking downstream from uh, the, the big drop on yellow jacket shells, if you're familiar with it, is uh, <coughs> about a half a mile downstream. And you're essentially looking at a river here that's just a series of trails. Uh, for rocks that during recorded history had, had only peaked above the water, never been dry like this. Um, this is the uh, Middle Oconee River in Athens during that drought. And uh, there's a shot of the Middle Oconee at Athens in a, in a wet and a, and a dry period during the last <coughs> 10 years. This is Radium Springs. Um, an iconic first order spring um, in Albany back in the day. Another shot from back in the day. This is Radium Springs today during a wet year um, and during the dry year when it ceases to flow all together. Um, so these are, these are um, visually major hydrologic changes. This is Itchaway Nachoway Creek at the Jones Center in Baker County. Um, the creek, the entire flow of it is right there. And you can tell from the oxidation on the rocks where the water 
was historically the norm weight. That's at about four cubic feet per second. Historic base load during major drought years is about 110 cubic feet per second. So, do the, do the data bear out these observations? Um, this is the Satilla at Atkinson at US 82. Um, the green line is before 1975. The red lines are after 1975. That's a very useful year to split data sets based on population in Georgia, based on ag, based on wetlands trends, based on everything I described. Um, based on the break in the climate. Um, it's, it's a useful place to, to split the data set. And th this is a plot of seven day minima for every year from the, um, from the, um, from the 1930s until um, 2018, 2017. Um, so staying on this seven day minimum theme, um, you can see that the median number of days um, and the, the 75th and 25th percentiles of, of, that, of that statistic have, sh have shifted markedly downward. So I, I want that to clue you into the dangers of using 7Q10 as a standard for anything. Because it's a, if you begin to think about it mathematically, it is, it's a, a road to perdition, if you will. It's a, it's a pathway to zero flows, because if you manage for it, it can continue to move down and down and down. This is a flow duration curve for August on the Satilla for that same period of time, with the, um, the blue being um, before 1975, and you can see how the character of the river has changed over time. This is the Flint River at Carsonville. You can see that it used to bottom out at 100 cubic feet per second. This is at the fall line on the Flint River. And now it bottoms out um, between 30 and 50 cubic feet per second. This is a plot of the seven day minima on the Flint and you can see the steady march downward. This is just a, a chronological plot of the seven day minimum average for each year. This is a plot, and you get 7Q10 by plotting it on a log graph, a log um, axis, and the pre-1975 data set is in black, the post-1975 data set is in red, and where it crosses the 10-year interval, that is 7Q10, and you can see that the actual 7Q10 has changed um, remarkably. So which 7Q10 are we managing for? Are we managing for the old one? Are we managing for the new one? Are we managing for the blended one? And the, the policy is not clear on that. This is Itchway Notchway Creek at Milford. You can see where it used to bottom out around 110 and now it approaches zero. Um, and this is a this is a plot of the this is the log plot to to determine looking at the old 7Q10 and the new 7Q10. It's interesting to note that Itchaway Notchaway Creek, um, before the era of, of heavy of heavy use, had a much tighter hydrograph than uh, the Upper Flint, much less noisy. The reason for that is that constant groundwater input from the floor of an aquifer that used to be there, that, that stabilized flow in, in that portion um, of the Flint River ecosystem. And just to make things interesting and confusing, this is a plot similar to the one that I threw up for the Satilla of the St. Mary's River um, for, the, for the seven day uh, this is this is actually one day minimum. I should have had the seven day, but the seven day, I, I apologize for that. Um, is substantially the same. Um, that median hasn't changed. Um, the 25th and 75th percentiles have. I mean, you can see that they spread out. That's probably just the noise in the ecosystem from the change in the rainfall. Is probably what that is. 
But this is this is over time proven to be a much more stable system than, than some of the other ones in Georgia. So this is not a problem everywhere in Georgia, but I think you can see I'm presenting the argument that the present flow policy is not adequate for protecting aquatic resources or the other uses that we have for rivers, which is swimming, just looking at it, wading, baptisms, paddling, all the things that we like to do in flow and water. This 7Q10 policy is, uh, is completely inadequate. And uh, for the first five or six years of my tenure at Flint Riverkeeper, that's sort of where the story ended. Um, but there are a lot of bright spots in this story, um, and we're going to save them for the moderated portion of today's, uh, of today's uh, symposium. Um, because I would like to move on now and, uh, and pass and just forego the questions if we could and go to uh, Damon Mullis from Ogeechee River Keeper next to talk about something that is perhaps much more uplifting. <laughs> Thank you for working.